In a world full of socio-political issues, one man searches for intelligent conversation. From Dedham, Massachusetts, the birthplace of modern democracy, this is You Don't Have to Yell with your host, Dan Sally. Welcome to episode 41 of You Don't Have to Yell, which, for those of us living under shelter-in-place orders, falls on the ninth week of March. It's the bad boy of nonpartisan political podcasting here with the most interesting candidate you have not heard of yet. Wacy Alpha Cody paid his way through college riding in rodeos before getting his master's in counseling psychology and then deciding to return to his roots ranching cattle, as we all do. Uh, adding to the number of reasons you can't be as cool as Wacy, he decided after all that to run as a candidate to represent Texas's 11th Congressional District in the House of Representatives as a Republican before realizing running as a major party candidate comes with some compromises he wasn't ready to make. So Wacy's currently running as a libertarian and has a platform that's genuine and very refreshing. And in this episode, we discuss that platform. We talk about rattlesnakes, of course, and... I couldn't help it. We talk about the rodeo because how could I not? I'll be back at the end with closing comments. Of course, first thing I have to ask you about is I have to ask you about the rodeo because you were, how many years were you? Well, so like I tell people, I think I'm done. If I never get on another bucking horse again, I'm I'm, I'm at peace with it. But I haven't sold my my Bronx out or Bearback Regan yet. At really? The same time. Yeah. No. I mean, there's parts of me that that I'll know. I just at a different place in life. I know I'm never going to just take off over summer and go rodeo because part of that was because of being in college that there was just this freedom associated with where I was in life, mm-hmm. and now I'm a, I'm my my career having cattle having a horse just to have a lot more permanent ties where before literally everything I owned, I could fit into the back of my pickup and camper and my, mm-hmm. I just had a camper, a setting camper, everything I owned could put in there and I could be, I could pack it in a day and be gone by that night. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, and so with, with having more responsibilities and ties to, to the here, geographically you just i just can't take off now i'm not going to eliminate that you know and because you never know what the future holds not next month or next summer just say you know what i'm gonna start getting on again but but i'm content if i never get on another bucking horse Um, yeah and and so you were just so just to make sure I I understand so you were just like a college kid and you were basically what, what was it like summer breaks or something you just drive around the country riding bucking horses is that how it worked I started rodeo and riding bareback and saddle bronc which are the for any of the listeners out there if you're watching a rodeo and you don't know a lot about it there's three events that are called rough stock and the animals buck in those two. Two of the events, bareback and saddle bronc riding, have bucking horses, and then there's bull riding, and it's pretty self-explanatory. Mm-hmm. I did the two bucking horse events, and I, I started over Christmas break when I was 16, my sophomore year of high school. Because of rodeo, I got rodeo scholarships. I got to go to colleges. Because of rodeo, I also didn't do real good at college sometimes, so <laughs> yeah. goals didn't line up eye to eye. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I was able to go to college. I was able to experience a lot of things, and some of that being traveling all over the country. Yeah, I was laughing back when you said it started Christmas break of your sophomore year, because I think Christmas break of my sophomore year, I asked my parents if I could take guitar lessons. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's about as extreme as I got. I wasn't, I mean, if there were horses around, maybe I would have thought of it. You're like fourth generation cowboy, right? So before they even had a word, Before they even called them cowboys, that's what your family was doing, right? Right. Yeah, essentially. I mean, that's you for for where they were geographically at that you're going back at that point. It's just surviving in southeastern Kansas type Mm -hmm. situation. 
I mean, at that point, everybody had a pig or a cow or this or that. A few, you know, everybody had chickens. Or if you didn't have chickens, you had a pretty good garden and you trade some tomatoes for some eggs. You're just, there were, there were professions. There were dentists and lawyers and bankers, but that, that class was a minority rather than the agrarian, just farmers subsistence people that was Mm -hmm. everybody and if you know i mean so to say you're you know a 10th generation cowboy is like well that doesn't even make sense because everybody filled that role at that point yeah you were basically like you're basically just to say you're a cowboy was effectively to say you were doing something to survive yeah i hadn't got a dysentery today so i guess i'm a cowboy (laughs) So now, and so you've kind of stuck with the family trades or ranching. Now, you also kind of took a winding road through college, right? There were a lot of forks in that path, yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and I probably took the tro- road less traveled by. I have a deep understanding, I guess, of, in many ways, of Americana, what it is to be us, because I've been to so many places and lived in Missouri and had conversations with people that if I would have stayed in, in San Angelo, I would have never met different people on different levels and learned that there's a lot more in common about all of us than there's different. Um, but went to Missouri, kind of got asked to leave there because uh, they had an attendance policy and uh, I, I wasn't <laughs> attending. Okay. So moved back home, got my grades up again. I got my grades up. Uh-huh. It's, there, there'll be a cyclical pattern to this they'll story. Be, they'll be in again later on. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then, <laughs> then went, went to Iowa Central Community College, came back home, got my grades up again, and ended up graduating from Angelo State University um, with a, because of all of the hours I'd accumulated, and some of them were in just vast. Like, I have an anthropology course. I have... I ended up graduating with a double major in history and psychology with an English minor. You know, it's funny, as you're telling this story, I'm thinking if you did better in school, you probably wouldn't have gotten to see so much of the country and probably wouldn't have developed the philosophy you have. Because I know one of the things we, you know, we talked about as we were kind of scheduling this interview was how you've got your opinions and, and, you know, there are definitely some stances you have that that I want to talk about a little later on, but generally your, your platform is, is number one based on the idea that you represent the 11th district. And so you're not real, you're not going in with some hard and fast black and white agenda. You're going in with the idea that what I need to do to represent the citizens and the voters of the the 11th district is my platform effectively, right? Yes. And I I think that you see it with a lot of candidates, or I don't want to say you say, I see it, or maybe I just interpret it as this. You, you say, well, I'm going to be a Republican candidate. So then you, then now you look up in the encyclopedia. Well, you Google, I guess would be the more, Mm -hmm. you know, what's, what's Republican. Well, I got to believe blank, 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 blank. And if I don't believe it, they'll blackball me or they'll, you know, they'll say, well, you're not going to be on this or that they'll figure out a way to get me in line. And the same as, you know, that's not a Republican problem. It's a politics problem. The Democrat party is equally as guilty that there's this, there's like a, just a standard definition of what it is. And it's, you either are or you're not. And if you mm-hmm. are not this, you don't match our, de- our, our definition, you're the enemy. And and it's like you can agree on ninety nine percent of things, but if you disagree on one thing, oh, you're not you're not Republican enough, or you're not Democrat enough. The current representative is named Mike Conaway, and he's been six terms or so. Not, don't quote me on that, but a, a multi term, well established Republican candidate. And I'm like, more of the same is not the answer at this point. So, I I. When I started this, I'm like, I'm, I've always voted Republican. I'm conservative. I'm this, I'm that. So it makes sense that I would run in the Republican primary against Mike Conaway. And then I start going to some of the meetings and I realize I'm not, 
I'm either too conservative to to pacify Republicans or not or I'll never be Republican enough. And what I mean is I'll never toe the party line over what the people tell me to do. And there's this disconnect to me in what is the human experience and what there's this all across the United States. I don't think in there are people that wake up that are murderers and rapists and evil people. But mm-hmm. by and large, our species is a quality, benevolent species. Otherwise, we'd have wiped ourselves out at the dawn of time. Yep. That we care more about our neighbors than we do taking stuff from them. Mm-hmm. We, mm-hmm. And, I, and I, I can back this up with science in that we, in our brains, have mirror neurons. And those mirror neurons, have you ever seen a sad movie or a funny mm-hmm. movie? Yeah. Did you did you did you get upset or cry during, you know, old yeller or where the red fern grows? Oh yeah. Or Fox and the Hound. That's not your yeah. dog. Fox and the Hound's not even a real dog. Exactly. But, but these these things fire off in our brain that that trigger empathy. And even though it's somebody you've never met, even though it's an actor on TV portraying a fictional you know work of art you still create this emotional tie and that ties in everyday life that's why it's you know there's even if you're I, it would take a very cold hearted son of a buck to walk past a child that's hungry mm-hmm. if you have a saying i mean just yeah. i don't believe that's a quality of people and yet in politics it's like you're evil or you agree with me because I think a person has the right to be gay or this or that, that, that didn't mean I want you to be gay on me. That just means I don't care that you're gay. It's none of my business how you conduct your life. I personally, it's been my belief for a long time that the, the two-party system as it stands is one where if you were to run on a platform that represents the majority of voters, your likelihood of winning an election would be basically a coin toss with the other person you're up against. But if you can get people fighting, if you can figure out the one thing that puts me at one side of the room and you at the other side of the room and make that your platform, then that's the way you win votes. And you tell me if this was your experience, because I, I feel like when we talk about, when you, t- when you look at the issues that people actually vote for, the issues that people cite as important, which is generally always in every presidential election is healthcare, the economy, and, um, and education, right? It, th- th- that's not what we talk about. We talk about guns. We talk about, uh, it will, like you said, at, at one point, it doesn't seem to be as big of an issue now, but we talk about gay marriage. You know, we talk about these issues that are going to put people on the opposite sides. And did you find that sort of going into the, the major party uh, arena first? The mm-hmm. average Joe that votes Republican or the average Joe that votes Democrat, by and large, have more similarities than they'd probably like to admit. Yeah, we have this uh, a me- a twenty four hour, especially with the advent of smartphones and tablets. We have mm-hmm. access to instant every s- single thing about Donald Trump's life, or AOC's life, or Nancy Pelosi's life. What she said today, what time she woke up today, all of this stuff that media has has allowed it that you can almost create this negative following towards a person. The, the everyday person doesn't fit the mold of the, of the Mitch McConnell's and the Nancy Pelosi's mm-hmm. because by and large, we're working to provide a better life for our kids, have more money, have $10 in the bank account at the end of the week instead of five. Yes, there was definitely a time when I was like, I can't be, I can't be the Republican candidate because I can't. If my constituents say, we, we believe in this, regardless of what it is, just we believe in blank. Yeah. But as the Republican candidate, I'm supposed to rep- support the Republican platform. To heck with the Republican platform, I support my constituents. Mm-hmm. And, and there was this, this almost kind of push towards, no, 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 you're a Republican. 
And then, oh yeah, now you stand for the Constitution. No, 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 no. We've, we, you have to do, I stand for the constituents as long as it's constitutional, period. Mm-hmm. If they're mm-hmm. asking me to, to give them all gold chains and diamond rings, that's unconstitutional because I've got to take it from somebody. Yeah. So I don't care if you want that. You might, next year or in two years, you have the right to vote in somebody that will give you that. But they're mm-hmm. not upholding the Constitution at that point. And I swore an oath to that as well. It sounds to me like like you felt like running as a major party candidate or running under the Republican monitor, you were going to be forced to make a choice between either being true to yourself, true to your constituents, or being true to the party platform. Is yes. I hearing you right there? Yeah. So being true to my constituents and true to to myself mm-hmm. trumped, pardon the pun, yeah. trumped party politics. Because yeah. if you're a lying sack of stuff... I don't mm-hmm. care if you're a Republican congressman from Minnesota or Mississippi or or California. No, you're still a lying sack of something. Mm-hmm. And yet a Republican, and this is what I see, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's like a Republican can't ever say a negative thing about a Republican, even if they're a lying sack of something. And the yeah. same goes for a Democrat. You can't be like, whoa, Nancy, like what? Just sh- sh- shut up. Like you're yeah. causing more problems. It's we got to toe the party line, and it's it's all about us, the party, not we, the people. Which are the first three l- words of your job description. Yeah, I mean, the, well, the the Constitution is your job description. Yeah, well, and if you look to it at how it breaks down, you know the presidential elections, for example, are typically decided by pretty thin margins. You know, this goes, this goes way back. So uh, same thing with the House of Representatives. If you kind of look back over the last 20, 30 years, for the most part, there's not, it, it's very rare you see a, a very wide percentage of the population vote one way or the other, even in the, 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 the uh, you know, what we call like the blue wave, red wave years. Um, and, and I think that sends a message that, you know, folks aren't necessarily sold on either. And really, in a lot of cases, it's kind of like a light switch. Are things good? Switch stays in the direction it's in. Are things bad? Flip the switch. And and I and I think part of that has to do with the fact that, you know, kind of to what you're saying, that these these platforms aren't necessarily designed to represent people at the local level. Um, they are uh, generally designed to again, put people to a side. And if you look at the number of people who vote, you look at, you know, the voter turnout rates historically, you look at the number of people who choose not to ally with either major party, which is a, a block that's bigger than either major party. And you, 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 you kind of get the picture that, that these folks aren't necessarily rep these, you get the picture that these folks aren't representing the people. And uh, I, I don't think there's anyone that would argue with that on either side of the political aisle, so to speak. Yeah. You know, your overarching theme is just how are you going to stay true to the the folks in the 11th district? But I know, y- you know, you have some interesting positions on you know, different issues. And, you know, one of the big things that jumped out at me and, and, and I'm curious about is, you know, you have a very clear position on mental health and criminal justice reform. And, you know, was that influenced by your education and your master's in counseling psychology or, or were there other things that factored into that as well? Well, if, if you're asking if I've been to jail, <laughs> <laughs> the answer to that is yes. Okay. Um, I wasn't going to go there, but I'm glad we, we got it out here. Not that, not that I'm necessarily <laughs> proud of that or yeah. think that that's, you know, a great stepping stone into a career in public service, but I'm also not going to hide it. Hey friend, as always, I hope you're enjoying the show. And also, as always, I have a favor to ask. Now, in this episode, Wacy discusses how running as a major party candidate would have forced him to make compromises that would have affected his ability to represent the district. And 
in a way, we're forced to make those compromises ourselves in the current system. And it's only through reforming the way elections are run and people are sent to Congress that we can get a legislative body that truly represents the will of the people. And so if you believe in this cause, I'm going to ask two things of you. Number one, subscribe to the podcast and share it with the folks you know. Only 38% of Americans feel the two-party system does a good job of representing their interests. So I know there are a lot more people out there who need to be involved. And number two, start a conversation with me. I'm on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, or you can go to my website, ydhty.com. I feel like I've been doing all the talking for the last 41 episodes, and I'm starting to get a bit self-conscious. So please, with that out of the way, back to the show. The notion, it, I guess it, 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 it comes from kind of a more, not so much me, that aspect, but yeah. more of an understanding of history, understanding of what the United States kind of originated as Mm -hmm. and what it wanted to what it wanted to be so i think it's georgia that colony started as a penal colony Mm -hmm. like that's we're gonna send people away and throughout criminal justice you, you you start looking at different ways societies have dealt with with people that break the morals and they behave in a taboo way Mm -hmm. and they don't and if it's not necessarily taboo it's definitely not the norm Mm -hmm. and you start to look at how societies have deal with that Mm -hmm. okay our society was originated to me off the premise that although it may be bad we would rather a guilty man go free than an innocent man be condemned Mm -hmm. That's that's why we have the the appellate courts. That's why we have a jury that decides most criminal cases, not just a person with an axe saying, sure, I'm going to cleave your head off now. Mm -hmm. The idea was that we're going to, in some way, take a maladjusted member of society and adapt them to become a well-adjusted contributing member of society. If I lost my job today, I could at least sub, sub, you know, survive by finding odd jobs, mm-hmm. whether that's building fence, mowing lawns, different things. Life has equipped me with skills that it's not I have one path or no path. Mm-hmm. There are people in our society that their trade was drug dealing. Mm-hmm. That's all they understand. So to think you're going to lock an individual up with other criminals, and then they're going to be released 5, 10, 15 years later Mm -hmm. with a skill that makes them equipped to be a contributing member of society Mm -hmm. is insane. It's it's pointless. How do we, instead of locking somebody up and then releasing the same person who's just a better criminal, we take, we say, you've proven you're not fit to be a free member of society. Mm -hmm. So where is that level of restriction? Maybe it's house arrest. Maybe it's mandated employment. Somehow, some way where you learn how to be a contributing member of society, all the while minimizing the expense on the public sector. Mm -hmm. Because if, if, like I did when I was getting my, doing mental health stuff, I did an internship at a court mandated substance abuse facility. And the idea is you're not stealing because you want to steal stuff. You're stealing because you don't have a better way to buy cocaine. Mm -hmm. So if you're no longer addicted to cocaine, you no longer have a need to steal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of how it breaks out. So if we start to a remove the dependence on a substance, Mm -hmm. okay. Cause I don't think anybody's going to say, you know, waking up on a Monday and thinking, "Woo, today's the day I get hooked on cocaine mm-hmm. is a good life goal. Like that's probably not good for anybody. Yeah. So removing that negative behavior and all the while figuring out how to create a system in which you are accountable to yourself so that like them, they, as they work through this program and it had its own 
problems. It absolutely did. But as they worked through their own program, they kind of earned more and more freedom. There were no locks on this facility. They could just walk out the door. But as soon as they stepped foot out of that door, they had just escaped a penal, you know, like it's like them running from or escaping from either jail or prison. Yeah. They had committed a felony instantly. Yeah. But there were no locks. It was just the guards weren't going to chase them, mm-hmm. or the monitors, I think was the official name. They're just going to call the U.S. Marshals, and it's instantly a felony that you're guilty of. Mm. But as as they progress through this program, they become more and more integrated into society, as well as they contribute more and more. So mm. now they're they have a job, but they still have to be at you know the 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 facility by a certain time. Yeah. So if they're and and don't, I mean, don't quote me on this, but if I'm spending money at McDonald's on my lunch break, that's one less lunch the taxpayers have to pay, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That's that's one more employee McDonald's gets to hire, which furthers the health of the community, mm-hmm. I mean, the economy. And all the while I'm earning money from nine to five, I'm being, I'm paying taxes, I'm doing this. I'm becoming a contributing member of society. I'm learning skills. Maybe it's now I realize I don't want to be a drug dealer. I want to be a small business owner. Mm-hmm. I really like cooking burgers or whatever that now we're, we're creating us. We're, we're working to create a system scientifically that allows people to go from where they are on day one to a completely different place on, you know, when they're released, mm-hmm. so to speak. So it's just a, if, if it's not work, because jail works to deter some people mm-hmm. from from doing crime. Yeah. It's everyone that's not in jail. Mm-hmm. Like, jail doesn't stop people in jail from committing crimes. Mm-hmm. That's why they're there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's start to look at what would work for them. And that's in mental health, when I'd be working for par- with parents, they'd be like, oh, isn't that a good punishment? I'd say, I have no idea what's a good punishment for your kid. Mm-hmm. You need to ask your kid. Because what's a good punishment to me and you, if it doesn't bother the child, Mm -hmm. it will never promote the behavior you want. Mm -hmm. And that's what the end of the game is, is you having a child that, you know, kind of lit, you don't necessarily want an, a, a, super obedient person because you just trained a yes, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want that, get a dog, Mm -hmm. but if you want a fully functioning child that can grow into a fully functioning adult, they need to understand certain things. And one of them is you're in charge. Yeah. With that being said, you and your child need to figure out what's the appropriate punishment or reward for any given scenario, not somebody that doesn't live with you. Yeah. And that's the same idea about, you know, criminal justice, mental health is figuring out what works for the people in that circumstance. Mm-hmm. So, and, and going back to the constitution and stuff, mm-hmm. that's one of the amazing things about how this country slowly was created is that, you know, if it works in Texas, there's no reason that Virginia can do it, but there's no reason they have to do it. Yeah. It's up to Virginia to deal with it. Yeah. And that's kind of like, I think that that seems to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, seems to be an overarching libertarian principle and seems to be an uh, a, an overarching principle with you, which is the idea is that very often these solutions are best found at the local level. You know, I can't, we can't apply the laws that work in Massachusetts where I live can't be applied to manage West Texas and vice versa. They're just two totally different places. Right. And so you're, the idea you're promoting here is, you know, rather than kind of saying, well, you know what, this policy works here, so we're just going to make the whole country do it this way. Rather, it's really letting the states figure out the best way to address these issues. And if there's something that I can learn from Texas and I can apply in my state of Massachusetts, or you can apply in Hawaii or wherever else, you do that, but that we're kind of judicious about and careful about how we decide to roll out policies at a sort of a blanket level. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll give you a, a, a great piece of evidence on it. Mm-hmm. Um, Cory Booker, during one of the Democratic debates, was touting his records as the mayor of Newark, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And, he's, and it was along those exact lines. It worked for Newark, therefore it will work for our nation. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And and I, I don't agree with Cory Booker on many things, probably anything, mm-hmm. politically speaking, where in the realm that I think politics should be speaking about. Mm-hmm. And yet your basis is that it worked in one city on the Atlantic seaboard of this vast nation mm-hmm. that has no mountains running through it, that has no desert, that has, you know, like your basis is this will work for an entire nation. Did you even understand what you just said? And that's and that's kind of, I think, getting back to the issue of, you know, some of the more divisive uh, issues that we talk about. You know, a lot of times what's going on is there are issues that are interpreted very differently in two different regions. And a great, great example is, is the gun issue. You know, when you, when you talk about guns in the Northeast, you know, typically what you're talking about is gun crime. You know, that's where that's yes. what folks are talking about up here, uh, because that's what you deal with. Typically, you you know, there's not a big uh, gun culture, not a big hunting culture. And so generally, if you are in possession of a gun, you're either in law enforcement, you are trying to protect yourself from somebody who might come in trying to take what's yours, or you might be looking to take what somebody else's. And it's a much different story when you get into a place like, you know, where, where you are, for example, where, where, you know, a gun is really more of a, of a necessity. We have a creature called down here called a rattlesnake in my house, in the house, when my dad was repairing the siding on the house, there, there was time where a rattlesnake got in the house and a gun was used to kill that rattlesnake mm-hmm. inside the house. Mm-hmm. It's there's a lot of cases where a gun is more associated with a tool than than you know an evil machine that's gonna kill your kids at school. And yet, in different parts of the nation, it's like a BB gun is this heinous, like a a, a gateway. A BB gun is a gateway drug to getting your M16 and shooting up a school. And it's like whoa, like. That didn't even connect with the way we visualize and understand guns in this part of the world, in my opinion. That's my own, I mean, that's my opinion, but that's, it's much more of a tool, whether that's protecting yourself Mm -hmm. from, I mean, animals or protecting your, your animals, Mm -hmm. your cattle, your sheep from other animals that want to eat those animals than, than, um, a way just to walk out and kill somebody. Yeah, you know, it's so first off, I'm going to make a call to anyone listening who happens to be on the left on this issue and just say, I think we can all agree in a bipartisan level or multipartisan level that there should be a rattlesnake exception to firearm ownership. So (laughs) if if you live around rattlesnakes, you're entitled to own whatever you need to take care of those things, number one. But you know, number two, something that's that that really never sunk in for me until I was out visiting a friend of mine who lived out in Montana and lived way out, you know, uh, lived way out in the in in the country out there, out in the mountains. And um, I remember, you know, there was an there was an instance where, um, you know, one one guy showed up at his house and he was a little drunk and he was mouthing off and whatever and he left. And I remember his dad, you know, the next morning his dad showed up and we were talking about it. And his dad said, he goes, and now his dad was a sheriff, mind you. His dad said, mm-hmm. the next time he comes by, you tell him you show up on my property again and I'll shoot you. And at first I was sitting there and I thought, okay, that's a little extreme, number one. Number two, the guy's a cop, so why is he saying that? And then it struck me. I mean, these guys lived a good half hour from the nearest police station. You know, so oh, yeah. Right? So yeah, I, I think I, I I think the the I think there's a look to to be real. There's there's a definite gun problem in urban America that that can be addressed and that needs to be addressed um, in a sensible way. I I, I don't I, I don't think the solution is implementing a policy that's going to affect people who need to either protect themselves or <laughs> shoot rattlesnakes. Personally, you know, I've dealt in, I've, I've, I've jumped into the issue, and what I've found is that, you know, generally, if you talk to the pro, you know, you talk to somebody who's pro gun, you talk to somebody who's anti gun, and you figure out what they want. Generally, the things that you'd need to make both parties happy are 
fairly easy to accomplish. And yet nobody pursues it because that would end the fight, right? Who's going to, who's going to, absolutely who, who's going to vote for someone who's going to compromise? You know, that's not why we vote. Well, and, well, and also if, if no party wants to win in the fight mm-hmm. or, or just simply agree to disagree, because then there's no longer reason to vote for me. Ooh, vote for me, vote for me. Yeah. Because here, I guess this is my approach on guns. Mm-hmm. It's pretty damn simple. Mm-hmm. The second amendment to the thing that created the federal government, because our nation has existed longer than our government has. Mm-hmm. It was ran for roughly 10 years under the Articles of Confederation. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the second amendment says the federal government has no business dealing with guns, period. Mm-hmm. But, but that doesn't mean California, Texas, and New York, New York can't say, okay, we believe there's a gun problem in our state. And, and if your state in its state legislature has a similar thing, mm-hmm. then break, go down to the county, go down to the city, go down to a level where it fits your citizens. At the same time, it does not restrict the rights of others. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then you start to say, okay, now, now government is working to, to kind of, to me, working for me instead of to to uh, control me, yep. I guess is kind of the way I would say it. Because now we're 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 not infringing on anybody else. Mm-hmm. I'm not infringing on my neighbor. I'm not infringing on somebody clear across the nation. But but I get to say, in my community, this concerns me. Mm-hmm. Now, what are we as a community? Are we just going to say we don't care, Wacy? You know, there's 99 percent of us that it doesn't concern, and then Wacy has to say, "Ooh, you know." I get that. Yeah. Okay, ninety nine to me. Maybe I need to try to find some a, a different community. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, I, I, it always shocks me that we talk about gun violence in the sake of in the in in the scope of school shootings or mass shootings. Mm-hmm. And yet, what well, to me, just looking at the way schools are, I'm not an architect. Yep. I've never built a school. But as I always say, since 1999, when Columbine occurred, schools are still relatively built the same way where small numbers of staff can control mass numbers of people. Mm -hmm. There's limited entry points, limited exit points, straight lines of sight. Mm -hmm. That's literally prompting shooting in a barrel behavior. If if we start to design schools both in and out Mm -hmm. where there is... You don't have to duck and cover because the literal, the, 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 the way the building is designed makes it where it's hard for one or two people to just, you know, mow down a cafeteria or mow down a movie theater or whatever. You, you start to engineer the buildings where we send our children off to, to where they're naturally easier to get police officers to uh-huh. the buildings. They're also easier to get s- children to safe areas, either within the building or outside the building. And if you're stuck in the parking lot, there's places you can duck and hide behind. Or if you're inside the actual building, mm-hmm. you can, you don't turn a corner and then have a hundred meters of hallway. That's straight to run down. There's turns, there's twists, there's, there's obstacles that will stop a, Either a, you know, just from a guy ch- slowly chasing you down these winding halls, he'll slow down, or b, he can't just line you out and shoot you, because it's. I mean, it's just like we're talking about using guns as hunting. Mm-hmm. It's hard to shoot a deer in a forest clear across the forest. Yeah. You need a clear line of sight, and that's how many of our where you hear about these shootings occurring. The building, the design of the building. Mm-hmm helps that tragedy occur. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing I, I throw in there too, is if you look at the total number of gun deaths, right? The ones that when folks are talking about gun control, the ones they care about are the homicides, right? I mean, the, ma- yeah. the majority of gun deaths are suicides, right? The vast majority. And, and those, I, look, I don't want to say people don't care about them, but I think you'd find, I think you get, you'd make, you'd, it'd be very difficult to get people to the ballot box to vote on that. 
However, uh, yeah, you know, coming 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 from the, uh, the mental health community, yeah. it's going to be hard to motivate a population to to stop suicides. But but it is whether it's armed forces, whether it's uh, teenagers, wherever, whether it's with a gun or with pills, whatever it is, that in itself is its own tragedy. And it's also a tragedy that we are not committing more resources to addressing that well, tragedy. And that, you know, it's funny because I, I talked with a guy and this is an episode that I recorded back in October, I want to say. And it was this guy who had moved from Ireland to Oklahoma to be with his wife, who's from Oklahoma. You know, Ireland has next to no gun culture whatsoever. So the guy comes over right. here. And but now Ireland has no gun culture. But what Ireland has, little known secret, and I'm going to say this to you as a Texan with the understanding it might offend you and everybody else in the district. <laughs> Ireland has fan- fantastic meat. I mean, the best meat I've ever had in my life. The best, you know, yeah, lamb, really? beef. It's You wouldn't think, but it's fantastic. So he goes to Oklahoma and is disgusted by the quality of the meat there. You know, and so he decides to take up hunting. His father-in-law owns this, you know, ranch with all sorts of pigs and deer on it. And so his favorite gun is the AR-15, the one that everyone on the left, loves to hold up as the, you know, the, the, the murder weapon of choice. And so I was talking to him cause I wanted to find out, okay, so a guy that comes from a relatively anti-gun country goes to Oklahoma, starts becoming a gun enthusiast. What does he think? And he told me, he said, I don't think it's a gun issue. I think it's a mental health issue it was precisely what he said to me. And he said, because you don't treat mental health in this country. And it sounds like that's kind of your, your thinking as well. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That we all we all tick. Mm-hmm. We all tick for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Some if you're a parent, sometimes you get you may hate your job, but you know that at the end of the day, your kids more matter more than your dislike for your job and no matter how bad your job is, you need a paycheck to provide for your kids. Mm-hmm. If you like having nice things, mm-hmm. you may hate your job or what, I mean, whatever, or, or the f- exact opposite. If you don't care about nice things and you're working at some massive firm as a CEO that makes a hundred million dollars a year mm-hmm. and yet you're miserable, you're like, I'll go live in a tiny home. I'll make $50 a week and yet I'll be happy. Counseling isn't necessarily putting the counselor in your shoes, but it, but to a degree, it is trying to understand where this person is coming from, regardless of whether you've been in their shoes or not, because you're you're trying to, you know, instill a premise of you matter more in this relationship than I do, mm-hmm. because you're the one that I'm here to help. So you got to always kind of reflect it back on the patient. And if you stop, just kind of stop and just think about that concept that a person values their life so little that they'll end it. It, it can kind of be a sad, or not kind of, it is a sad and solemn thing to think. There's nothing anyone could have done to stop this kid from doing this in this moment in time because they've had no value. There's, not, there's no halt or a shoot. Their response is, I don't care. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do? Kill me? And most of us, that doesn't even really compute because... Stop or I, I shoot stops most of us because we do care about our own finite mortality. Yeah. So you, I, there's a lot of, and and that's another thing is the crime, the 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 occurrence when and again we're just kind of discussing mass shootings more than the like you said mm-hmm. uh, homicides in general, mm-hmm. but that didn't start that that morning. It you, know- you don't you don't wake up and say, woo, I'm going to get addicted to Coke, as I, I think I kind of used that reference earlier. Yeah. And you also don't just wake up on a Tuesday, a happy, loving, you know, fun loving teenager on Wednesday, you're ready to murder half your school. Yeah. And, and, and I think too, the other thing is, you know, when it comes to school shootings as well, that is such a small, small, I mean, they're terrible. Don't get me wrong. But the, if you really want to reduce gun homicides, you eliminate every school shooting. You haven't even scratched the surface. And, right. you know, and so but you hit the headlines. Yeah, well, that's it. And I think it kind of it kind of gets back to this theme that we keep uh, revisiting here is, you know, this idea that 
that a lot of times what we're told or what we're, I guess, conditioned, for lack of a better phrasing, to discuss in uh, in in politics are really these 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 horrible uh, fringe cases or these horrible fringe issues that that really don't matter. And if I'm and you tell me if I'm summing up your candidacy and your philosophy wrong, but you know when I when I listen to you. You know, really what I'm hearing is somebody who likes to deal with problems at the root. So let's not just take the easy answer, like, for example, build more prisons and just warehouse people. Let's really like go after the root of the problem, number one, figure out an effective solution. But number two, you know, let's make sure that 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 people are empowered at the local level to take care of these things. And is that am I right or am I am I off base there at all or? No, no. I, one time a person said, what are you going to do about the homeless problem? And, and there's a little, there's a little town outside of San Angelo. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I, as a United States congressman, what am I going to do about it? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, nothing. <laughs> and they're yeah. like, what? And I'm like, think about it. If I do anything, it's got to go through so much bureaucracy. It will never, you know, truly adapt to the, your little town. Yeah. But now what can I, as a caring member of a community, do? Oh, countless options. I can try things on a day-to-day basis and see what it worked, whether it worked, how it worked. Mm -hmm. You can do way more than your U.S. Congress. And this is for anyone listening to this, regardless of their political philosophy, Mm -hmm. you as an individual in your community matter more than your United States congressman. And I will believe that to the day I die. Because you can change your community. You can volunteer at, the, at your soup kitchen. You can work at the food bank. You can do so many things that the federal government is too inefficient and too bloated and too bass backwards to do. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, I think the thing that we've forgotten in this country is that democracy isn't showing up every November and putting somebody else in charge of doing things. It's having the liberty and having the freedom and having the power to actually affect change uh, in your own community. And I think I think we're content to really, and I say we in a broad standpoint, I know there are lots of people out there doing good work, but I think there are a large portion of people who feel like sitting, watching TV, getting in fights on social media, and then voting a certain way is fulfilling your duty as an American. And I really think, I think it's, it's, it's not a spectator sport, as they say. I don't think so that, I mean, cause I'm conflicted on that. And, and no. I, we really, I don't know if we've got into really why I'm running for office per se, Yeah, but part of it was, I don't have children of my own, but I'm, I have friend, dear friends that are now having children. And I, and I never wanted them to ask me, well, what did you do? And my answer would mm-hmm. be, well, I voted. And, yeah. and I don't mean that negatively to those that choose to be truck drivers, teachers, police officers, whatever your life calling is. Every November, go vote. Because, yep. but, but do it knowledgeably. Just take a little time and say, the community matters, my state matters, my nation matters, and be truly a little more informed than just the R or the D. There's there's a party called the, Con- the Constitutionalist or the Constitution mm-hmm. Party. I probably, with it, just that being the name, I'm assuming it's kind of constitutional based. I probably would agree with a lot of things they say, but you can't, at the same time, you can't say, well, the Constitution trumps liberty. No, the Constitution was designed as a living, breathing document that could be changed Mm -hmm. at any time, and hopefully not, but if everybody in the U.S. said, you know what, we're kind of tired of all of it. We're (laughs) U.S. government 3.0. Like, there's nothing in the Constitution that I have read that says you can't recreate it. Yep. It is literally a document of the people, for the people, by the people, and the people at any given time can change it to fit their needs with, again, not infringing on others, though. Now, something I'd love to hear from Wacy, and I've said before on this show, 
Wacy operates under the belief that democracy is not a spectator sport. It's just not enough to show up in November, cast your ballot, and spend the rest of your time getting mad at the television and starting fights on social media. There are people in your community who need your time and they need your effort. And the only way we're going to make America great again, to borrow a phrase, is to be great ourselves at the local level. And, you know, Wacy also touches on a problem I've had with our two-party duopoly, which is we're not being asked to vote for the candidate we like the most, but rather the one we dislike the least. And until we remove the structural issues that keep minor party candidates like Wacy from having an equal voice in government, that's going to be our only choice. Now, to that end, next week, I'll be talking with Dan Vicuña, National Redistricting Manager for Common Cause, whose work focuses on eliminating partisan gerrymandering from the map. And now it turns out, even with a law degree, the job is not easy. So I hope you'll join me to learn why. Right up of this episode and other content can be found on ydhty.com. Visit us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook by searching for You Don't Have to Yell. On Twitter, you actually have to do the letter U because they wouldn't let me write the whole thing out. It's too long. Music for YDHTY, courtesy of Kefeller Tack. YDHTY is produced in North Carolina by the big Gino, Jason Putney, who has also killed a snake. Until the next, this is Dan Sally. Adios. Adios.